This is the Energy Education Podcast for January 13th, 2013. I'm Kevin Hurley. Today on the show, we'll talk about what are likely the three most problematic nuclear power plants in the U.S. First, uncertainty at the Fort Calhoun plant regarding issues of possible flood risk have been a topic of conversation for some time. Now, a former government geologist is weighing in on the issue. We'll take a closer look at what he's saying. Next, the Crystal River nuclear plant has spent four years asking themselves one question. We'll talk about that too. Also on the show, we'll talk about the highly controversial issue of recycling radioactive materials from nuclear power plants back into the consumer product line. Now, to discuss all of this and more, we're joined by Fairwind's chief nuclear engineer, Arnie Gunderson. Arnie, thanks for coming on the show. Hey, Kevin. Thanks for having me yet again. Well, some more news coming out of the situation in Missouri with the Fort Calhoun plant and the possible risk uh, from flooding in, in the event of a uh, failure of an upstream dam. Can you start off today just by talking a little bit about that? Yeah. You, you know, we've been talking about four nuclear reactors out of the 104 in the nuclear fleet. Uh, and those four are the, the two at San Onofre, um, the Fort Calhoun, and Crystal River. All of them have been shut down now for more than a year. Uh, they seem to be the uh, the bad apples in the in the nuclear uh, bushel basket right now. All three of them had um, major news this week. Well, then why don't we start off with Fort Calhoun and uh, talk a little bit about what's happening in Missouri this week? Well, Fort Calhoun continues to be shut down, and now they're saying, well, sometime in the first quarter of 2013, it's likely to start up. But I think that'll get pushed out and out and out, as we discussed in the last podcast. Just this week, they were looking for some pipes, and they weren't where the as-built drawings said they were. So this issue of configuration management continues. But also, uh, what what is really, really important for the safety of the entire Midwest is this issue that we've been talking about now for 18 months, and that's the failure of an upstream dam from from Fort Calhoun. You you know, you might remember that the plant was entirely flooded and they had uh, sandbagged the plant. And, of course, I said on, I I think, Democracy Now! that sandbags and nuclear power plants don't belong in the same paragraph. Well, uh, I'm not alone in that concern. There's a a person who's come forward. uh, His name is Dr. Bernard Shanks, S-H-A-N-K-S. And... He's a heavy hitter. He's been in many, many positions of responsibility, uh, including in California and and throughout the country as director of different agencies. And he basically has said exactly the same thing that I did. So Dr. Shank's position is that the upstream dams are in such poor condition because they're so old that they could fail and if we have a, a condition where there's a lot of water behind the dams, like two years ago, the, uh, the failure of one dam could cause all of the others to cascade. Now, what that means is that all the way down in St. Louis, which is a long way down, people would be waist deep in water. But more importantly, up at the Fort Calhoun plant, we're looking at 35 feet more water than there was just in the in the flood 18 months ago. We're not talking about the little facility on the water where the service water pumps are. Uh, that would obviously be inundated. But 35 for more feet of water would, um, would flood an awful lot of the safety-related components. This plant isn't designed for the failure of an upstream dam. During Fukushima Daiichi, I said that if the Unit 4 fuel pool catches fire, it would be uh, Chernobyl on steroids. Well, well Dr. Dr. Shanks has a, a, a quote that's similarly important and frightening. He said that if a uh, upstream dam were to fail, it would cause a flood of biblical proportions. So these plants are not designed against biblical floods. These plants were right at their limit that back in the flooding two years ago. So. You know, we've got two issues at Fort Calhoun that are keeping the plant shut down. The first is that they don't know how it's built and they can't find the right drawings and the right calculations. 
that's bad enough. But the, the bigger issue is, according to Dr. Shanks and, and many other uh, geologists and hydrologists, the condition of the upstream dams is suspect. So, Arnie, you've been talking for a long time about the potential risk to some nuclear power plants in the event that they lose their ultimate heat sink. And that's to say, if they lose their water pumps, just like Fukushima did during the 2011 tsunami. Now, if I understand you, what you're saying now is that in the case of Fort Calhoun, if an upstream dam were to break, this this is a bigger problem than simply losing the water pumps and losing the ultimate heat sink. Yeah, that's exactly right. At Fort Calhoun, if an upstream dam were to fail, um, we're not talking about a couple more feet of water. We're talking about you know 35 more feet of water. The, the other plant that falls in that category is the Oconee units that are downstream of a very large dam as well. And um, it wouldn't just flood the the emergency service water pumps, but it would likely flood other safety-related structures too. So there's two that are in the category of uh, uh, an upstream dam doesn't just wipe out the service water, but likely floods other safety-related stuff. You know, Dr. Shanks has also said that he has evidence that shows that during the flooding, the Army Corps of Engineers was frantically trying to shore up those upstream dams. They added some um, uh, a foot of height to one of the dams, and uh, down at the bottom of another dam, they shored it up because there were indications that it was weak at its base. So we are not really talking about some kind of an academic once-in-a-million-year exercise here, but we came close two years ago. And uh, whether the Army Corps of Engineers wants to admit it or not, th these dams are old. And uh, in the event of uh, an, another flood like we had on the Missouri just two years ago, we would put the entire Midwest in jeopardy, not just from the flood, but of course from a, a nuclear accident as well. So following the meltdowns in Japan, many of the U.S. nuclear authorities said that uh, we were safe here in the U.S. because a tsunami like that couldn't happen here. But with this new information, uh, it sounds like what you're saying is that essentially uh, a tsunami like that, an inland tsunami, could happen here. Oh, yeah. Th these, uh, this is an inland tsunami, if you will. You know? These plants are, you know, Fukushima at least was designed for a 12 or 15 foot tsunami. And these plants aren't designed for that at all. So it's not just the height of the wave, it's, but also it's what the plant is designed to withstand. And no one is assuming the, uh, the worst case, which is the upstream dam failure. You know, you look at these dams, and they're pretty substantial. You look at them and say, wow, that's going to last forever. But if you looked at Fukushima Daiichi one day before the accident, you wouldn't believe that a 45-foot-tall wave would have hit it either. Um, Mother Nature can do things that, in our wildest dreams, we can't imagine happening. You know, we've posted... Some, some articles written by Dr. Shanks are, are going to be posted next to this podcast on the web. So if readers are interested in finding out more about Dr. Shanks, uh, some of his material is uh, on, the, on our website. So, Arnie, did Dr. Shanks say how likely he thought an event like this was? He is concerned that it's a lot more likely than the Army Corps of Engineers is willing to let on. Um, I think his biggest concern is the age of these dams. These things are, uh, you know, they, they date back into the 30s, from uh, uh, between the 30s and the 50s, when we were um, doing vast public construction. So we're talking about structures now that are, you know, a half a century old. That gives Dr. Shanks a cause for concern. Now moving on to another plant that you've put in the bad bushel category, the Crystal River plant. Crystal River has spent the past four years asking themselves one question. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, the, the story on Crystal River is that in 2009, they were going to replace their, um, their steam generators. And rather than get someone who had familiarity with cutting uh, the nuclear containment in half, to slide the uh, steam generators in, they decided that they were going to do it themselves. You know, it's sort of like, well, they slept at a 
Holiday Inn Express, so therefore they became experts. Well, the net effect of that was that when they cut this huge hole in the side of the containment, it cracked. And the containment crack was about 40 to 60 feet long and about 20 feet high. And it ran around like, a, uh, like the belt on a radial tire. It ran all the way around the containment. They then said, well, we'll fix it. They spent a year trying to fix it. They tightened it up again. And it cracked not once more, but twice more. People on it could actually feel the building vibrate when these, uh, uh, when these cracks propagate it. So they thought they had it right when they did it the first time. They didn't. They thought they had it right when they did it the second time, and they didn't. And so they've been shut down since 2009 and not generating any power, yet they're paying their staff, they're paying the security, they're paying the uh, operators to requalify, paying the engineers to keep the plant. They, they probably spent upwards of close to a billion dollars already keeping a plant that can't run staff with, a, with its professional complement. So just this week, they met in, uh, in, in Florida with the regulators, and they said they're still not sure they're going to fix it. They then went on to say that they're still negotiating with the insurance company, and depending on what the insurance company says, they may, they may pull the plug. But in the meantime, Floridians are continuing to pay exorbitant rates for a plant that doesn't, doesn't run. You know, it's sort of like having the, uh, a professional football team have the quarterback get injured. Well, the, this quarterback is going to be injured for six or seven years, but yet Florida Power and Light is expecting the season ticket holders to keep paying to come to games that don't get played. I don't think that's a, a, a reasonable way to run a business. Basically, they're soaking the ratepayers of Florida in an attempt to keep this idled plant from going belly up. So it's been four years, and they're still trying to make a decision. That's right. That's right. They, the, the previous owner was Progress Energy, and they sold to Duke. And Duke is uh, seriously considering pulling the plug on the plant. It's interesting because last week we had a uh, financial analyst at UBS suggest that uh, Vermont Yankee didn't make any economic sense. And this week, we've got a financial analyst at, uh, at another firm called Fitch. And he says that the um, Crystal River plant will likely be closed because Duke can't make economic sense out of it. So, you know, the dominoes are starting to fall. We've had Kiwani, uh, which is shutting down in the Midwest because of uh, financial reasons. And now we've got UBS analysts and Fitch analysts also claiming that it makes no economic sense to keep uh, other nuclear plants running. We're going to post that Fitch uh, story on the website so people can, uh, uh, can read about it as well.